Just a nasty everybody. Um, welcome to Sharing in Song, part two. Um, it's a national um, a church music institute um, sponsored by the Mideastern Federation and the National Forum of Orthodox, Greek Orthodox Church Musicians. Um, the purpose of these workshops and in, in this um, series is to deepen our faith through the understanding of the hymns of the Paschal season. Uh, tonight's workshop is the uh, fourth of five in a series, and we're going to focus on um, the uh, substitution for the Trisayon for Pentecost. Um, we, um, um, so I would, uh, so we have um, uh, Father Dean Kokanis of Ipapandi of Pittsburgh, who is going to um, share with us um, his theological um, explanation. Um, Father Dean, uh, who is at Ipapandi in Pittsburgh, um, was originally from Pittsburgh. He grew up in Pittsburgh. And after earning a master's degree from Carnegie Mellon, he, uh, he went to Holy Cross uh, Seminary. And he um, was very active in the Byzantine music program at the seminary. And um, he was ordained in 2013 and served the parish of Annunciation Cathedral in Columbus for a number of years. And then he became Proistaminos of Ipapandi in Pittsburgh. So we're very pleased and honored to have Father Dean with us this evening. And he will start us off with an opening prayer and then go right into his talk. Good evening, everyone. Um, Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy, Christ our risen Lord, we thank you for bringing us together for this opportunity to learn more about the sacred hymnography of your holy church and how it can draw you closer to us and through you closer to one another. Bless our discussions for your holy now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. All right, good evening, everyone. I am delighted and honored to be speaking to Mevgox. I am grateful to all of you for everything that you have done um, to move along church music in the Greek Orthodox Church. And I'm personally grateful for the support that Mevgox offered me uh, when I was in seminary. Uh, although I only graduated seminary about nine years ago, uh, I am a child of the 80s. Can you all see my screen? Let's see what we got here. Not we can see screen. you, but not your screen, Father. Okay. You'll have to share. And it. as a child of the 80s, I grew up playing the original 8-bit Nintendo system. One of my favorite games for the original Nintendo was Tetris. In Tetris, blocks of various shapes and sizes scroll down the screen. The object was to get them to fit perfectly into a puzzle, a complete picture. Moving parts, varying lengths and forms, an implied time limit and I had to get them all into the right place at precisely the right moment. Little did I realize that when I was playing Tetris, this childhood obsession was preparing me from a young age to coordinate the moving parts of the music of the divine liturgy. So often I hear people say, oh, the liturgy father, come on, it's the same thing every week. Of course, those of us who have had the joy and even the blessing of spending time in the choir loft or at the psalterion, know that this is far from accurate. There are many very important moving parts in our hymnography. For instance, the hymns surrounding the small entrance vary from service to service. Indeed, all of our hymnography, whether it changes or not, is the greatest teaching tool of the church. We, what we say or sing is what we believe. I always tell the people in my adult education class, come to Matins and we'll never have to have class again. Everything is right there in the hymnography. So we use these moving parts, these variable hymns to emphasize themes or messages of particular feast days. In the parish which I serve, we print those hymns in the bulletin every Sunday and encourage the congregation to sing along at the very least with the hymns around the small entrance. For example, each parish has a patronal feast day. The parish of the Presentation of Christ has our hymn, St. Nicholas Cathedral has their hymn, and in most divine liturgies, that of Politikion, 
is sung at the small entrance, and we learn something about the feast or the saint being mentioned. Feast days, and especially major feast days, are marked with a specific apolitikion and contakion for the liturgy. Some feast days of the Lord call us to alter even more than just the apolitikion. For example, Pentecost, for which we alter the Trisayon hymn. In a typical Sunday divine liturgy, we start with a portion of the service called the anarchies or the entrance. Now, this isn't the small entrance or the great entrance as we would think of it. This refers to a historical period when the clergy and the faithful were just entering into the church as the service was beginning. So the anarchies begins with blessed is the kingdom of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. And it concludes with the Trisayon hymn, which is sort of like the high point of that part of the service, which fits inside of the first half of the service that ends with the readings, sometimes called the Liturgy of the Word. Right? So normally, the Trisayon hymn is Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. As we said, for certain feast days of the Lord, including Pentecost, the hymn is changed. For example, for the Feast of the Cross, we sing, before your cross, we fall down in worship. On Pentecost, we sing, you who have been baptized in Christ have put on Christ. Alleluia. This particular musical setting is taken from Ages Initiative, uh, formerly E. Matins. So let's give it a quick listen. You who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, alleluia. So we sing this hymn, and it talks about baptism, but it's Pentecost, but we're talking about baptism. So why do we make this substitution where we sing a hymn about baptism on Pentecost? So to understand this, let's consider a little bit of church history. In the year 2021, if we want to have a baptism, we find a little baby, we find a parish priest, and we schedule a baptism. My little girl being baptized by Metropolitan Savas of Pittsburgh. In the ancient church, however, there were specific times of the year when baptism and chrismation took place. Typically, adults were entering the church, and they were doing so after an extensive period of preparation. So at this point in history, the baptism rite, what we think of this as the baptism service, was offered within the context of the divine liturgy, which meant the first half of the divine liturgy was also the service of baptism. And the actual dunking of the baby took place in the first half of the service so that the newly, uh, excuse me, dunking of the adult, so that the newly baptized Christian could receive the holy mysteries. But it didn't happen in just any liturgy. There were specific occasions on which baptism took place. So on those days, when these group baptisms were permitted, this hymn about baptism was substituted for the usual Trisayon hymn. For the first example of this was Holy Saturday morning, the first proclamation of the resurrection, the harrowing of Hades, sometimes called Proti Anastasi. I'm sure we're all familiar with the long string of readings from the Old Testament that takes place on Holy Saturday morning. It was during these readings of the Vestral Divine Liturgy that the catechumens were all lined up, taken to the baptistry, and baptized. And in our parish, we have sort of a local custom where if we can, we try to time up chrismations with Holy Saturday morning. And this is a gentleman being chrismated on Holy Saturday morning in 2019. So, Holy Saturday morning, people are chrismated, baptized, brought into the church. Fantastic. But why on Pentecost? We just did this 50 days before on Holy Saturday morning. Why would we sing the baptism hymn on Pentecost? So to answer this question, let's take a look at the Pentecost icon and consider what happens on Pentecost itself. So, Let's give a quick listen to the reading from the Acts of the Apostles for Pentecost. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, 
They were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues, as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused, because everyone had heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthenians and Medes and Elamites, those dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. Incidentally, we find out in this reading that there was only one car present in biblical times because the disciples were all there in one accord. So uh, if we look at the Pentecost icon, we have the disciples gathered together and also present were Mark, Paul, and Luke. Now, Mark and Luke were not at Pentecost and Paul had not yet accepted Jesus Christ. He was still Saul the persecutor, but they're depicted in the icon because of the work they did to spread the church initially. So we have the disciples here, but one person is noticeably absent. In the center of the picture, Jesus Christ is not where he should be because he has ascended into the kingdom, but has not yet sent the comforter, the Holy Spirit, until now. Now we hear rushing down upon the apostles, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Those little dots above their heads, the little tongues of fire represent the grace of the Holy Spirit, which initially, which incidentally, I think would be a great church fundraiser. Tongues of fire, chili cook-off. Once we're after COVID and we can have food again, great idea. Feel free to steal it. So we see here that the seal of the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles at Pentecost. And with the reception of the Holy Spirit and with their newfound fluency in any language, they were now fully prepared to begin spreading the message of the risen Christ to all the nations. And this is where it ties back into baptism, or more specifically, chrismation, and the reception of the Holy Spirit. Today, we tend to think as babies as being baptized and chrismated, and more often than not, adults are just chrismated. But in the ancient church, there was no concept of baptism and chrismation being separated, at least not with the common uh, amount that they are now. So when a person was baptized, they also received the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is what the priest says when he puts the chrism on the person. Receive the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit, as did the apostles on Pentecost. This hymn denotes feasts when baptisms and chrismations historically took place and reminds us of the descent of the Holy Spirit on the apostles and on us. Now, history is great. But when I work with my OCF college students, they always say to me, Father, this ancient church stuff is very interesting. But what have you done for me lately? So what does this Pentecost substitution hymn mean for us in the year 2021? To answer the second question that I propose, let's consider the fuller text uh, that the hymn is taken from. The hymn that we all know and love says, you who have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, alleluia. But this is, in fact, from a larger letter that St. Paul wrote, where he continues, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In the original Greek, the word there, translated rightly as clothe yourself, can also be understood to sort of sink into. Imagine laying down on one of those waterbeds in the 80s where you just fall into the whole thing. Or to become as close to as possible. In other words, at this point of receiving the Holy Spirit, of being fully initiated into the church, which naturally leads to Holy Communion, we are as close to Christ as we can be. 
But the passage continues, there is neither Greek nor Jew, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Which means that we are not only intimately connected to Christ, whose love surpasses all understanding, but we are intimately connected to one another. This connection through baptism, chrismation, and communion surpasses any dividing or separating factor. Indeed, in the anaphora of the divine liturgy of St. Basil, which we hear on Holy Saturday morning, the priest prays, unite them to one another, Lord, those who partake of the one bread and the one cup. The apostles were set out united to preach the word to all the nations, to everyone. This hymn and the larger text that it comes from remind us of the unity of faith that binds believers. And that takes us back to Tetris. Ecclesiastical Tetris leaves us to try to place the pieces of the Tipicon where they belong, to try to get all those moving parts and readings and hymns in the right place. But the world is filled with larger moving parts called people. Some click well together, some don't. But this Trisayon hymn, and the Feast of Pentecost more broadly remind us that baptism in Christ, being clothed with him, is open to all. Even more so, it reminds us that we are spiritually descended from the apostles that received the Holy Spirit. The apostles that were told to go out and baptize all the nations, all of them. The apostles that were equipped with the ability to make faith linguistically accessible to everyone. The apostles that were told to clothe all the world in Christ as their spiritual descendants, as people clothed and enveloped in Christ. We have a responsibility. We are duty bound, as this hymn reminds us, to carry that work onward. So it's our job to play Tetris, not only with the liturgy, but with the whole world. Amen. Thank you, Father. Um, that was that was great. Okay, um, Vicky, are there any questions? No, they're not. Okay, then we'll move right along. And um, I'd like to um, introduce and, and welcome Dr. Nicholas Marigas. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, know uh, Dr. Marigas. Um, the doctor is a medical doctor. He's an ENT uh, from the Mayo Clinic. Um, and Nick, are you you're retired, aren't you? Yes, thank you. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, that's a good place to be retired. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. Um, um, but um, as far as his musical background, uh, Not Nick retired. <laughs> yes, no. You, I don't think we can ever, as church musicians, no. I don't think we ever retire. Um, but uh, Nick began his musical career at age six when he was playing the piano. And throughout his youth, he was active musically with orchestra and symphony. Uh, but of course, his love for music and his love for his church um, brought him to church music. And he published, he arranged and published his four part liturgy in 1981. Um, and it's been uh, uh, presented at many uh, choir federation conventions. Most of us have probably sung it at one time or another. Um, he's also arranged um, lots of other music, liturgical music for Holy Week, weddings, and so forth. Um, he received the St. Romanos medallion in 1992 for his contributions to uh, church music on the archdiocesan level. Because in, a, in addition to his um, <clears throat> publishing uh, music, he is also um, one of the um, authors, researchers of the guidebook. <coughs> Excuse me, allergies. Um, and so he received the medallion for that. He's also, I believe, a founding father of the National Forum. <laughs> um, First so, <laughs> So um, with that, um, we welcome Dr. Nick, and um, he's going to talk about 
um, Ossis Houston musically. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Um, don't look too hard at the back wall here. It's I'm sitting in my office at home down in my basement and put on as many lights as I could have because it it just hailed here. It was bad. <laughs> it was bad outside. But um, as Barbara said, uh, you can retire from medicine, but you never really retire from the church, and that's great. Father uh, Dean, that was a, a great talk. I really enjoyed it. As I was going through everything to, uh, uh, to try to uh, piece together something to tell people that they would, uh, not that they couldn't understand it, but uh, that it'd be something new for people to do because I hate giving old information to everybody. Um, Father Dean took all of my stuff, <laughs> except for the second, except for the second and uh, last of the slides that I have for the uh, for my uh, uh, talk. The first, the the next slide um, that you can see is, and I apologize for the Greek font. Um, my computer blew up about, one of my four computers blew up about six months ago, and I have yet to find any of the other three computers that I have that can use a, a Greek font. And I saw that Father Dean had one, so Father Dean, I need to know what you're using. Um, but as uh, uh, picking up where Father Dean said, the uh, and reiterating a little bit, because um, if we repeat things, sometimes they stick a little bit better. As many of us, as, uh, as many as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. This is the Osiris Christon uh, that, <clears throat> that we're talking about today. comes from Galatians uh, 3.27. And it's also supported by, uh, in two other of... Um, uh, St. Paul's verses in, in Romans is substituted for the Ios of Theos at all the high feasts. And what are the high feasts? Well, in, uh, as Father already told you, the high feasts in the beginning were bringing people into the church. <clears throat> Today, the high feasts actually, uh, and I should, I should uh, let me go back one step. And what, what are those feasts? and I've got them listed here. These are the days where we celebrate liturgy and sing the Osius Christon. I don't think I've forgotten any. Um, and I have them grouped into three parts there. This is, this is my uh, take on it. <clears throat> You'll see the first one, the first group there is real baptism. And we understand that today. The second four, though, look at what we have. We have the Saturday of Lazarus, Holy Saturday, Pascha, and all of Bright Week. And if you look at that group of four days there where we celebrate, those are all days where we're celebrating, um, in essence, a resurrection. The resurrection of Lazarus, the resurrection of uh, the um, prophet, not Job, Jonah from the whale. Remember that reading from on Holy Saturday, the three youths. So you've got the, the three main, uh, main resurrections there. And then on Pascha, of course, Christ's resurrection and all of Bright Week, uh, Bright Week as a celebration of that resurrection. The last uh, three are broken into Pentecost and the Monday of the Holy Spirit, uh, Spirit. Both of those days are involved with the Holy Spirit, as are the first two, Theophany and the Synoxus of St. John the Baptist. Both of those groups are where we see the Holy Spirit in uh, in our lives, if you will. And of course, the nativity of Christ, where the Holy Spirit came and was with 
the Virgin Mary and Christ was born from that. So <clears throat> if you're looking for high feast days, those, those are the high ones, the highest of the highs, if you will. And we all know there's uh, eight feast days uh, for Christ and four for the Virgin Mary, but these are the highest. And those days were in fact chosen uh, in the early church to baptize people. So we have that um, as the Trisayon substitution for the Ios of Theos. Um, I have, I had, uh, if, if, uh, Tidiakos, did you, did, did you get? I have uh, the recording up and ready to go. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, why don't Always we. Always behind uh, the scenes doing something. Yeah, yeah, you are. And I was kind of behind the scenes trying to find it for you. I appreciate uh, it. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, I appreciate that. Uh, so this is this is actually everybody. This is hot off the presses. I've changed this hymn probably three times in the last uh, fifty years, and this rendition uh, is probably the one that'll stick at least for the next hour or so. Um, but the Greek, of course, is uh, is typical. That the uh, Osis Christon is. Plego first, and it is, um, it's always in Plego first, and it, it's very interesting. Usually, we think of one of the hierarchs coming to us, uh, and we sing the, uh, the uh, Ios to Vimatos, which is the Ios of Theos. But if they come on a high holiday, this is the hymn that you have to kind of divide up and try to figure out where you're going to, uh, where your priest wants you to divide it up. But for now, we'll sing it. Um, well, we'll look at it at least. I'll try to sing it. The, uh, the hymn is uh, the normal hymn that we sing. Osis Christon Evaptisite. Christon and the Sasta, Alleluia. That's sung three times, of course, in the Doxapati and Kenin. And then the refrain, uh, the last part of this is repeated. Christon and the Sasta, Alleluia. I put a little, what is that thing called? Coda, a coda mark. Uh, where it should be. Oh, that's interesting what you just did there, Kitty Um uh, A quarter mark to where you go back to so that you can, uh, you can do that. It's a joyous hymn, it's the, despite the fact that it's, uh, it's in the, quote, minor uh, key. It's, it's sung joyously. It's about the baptism, about bringing people into the church. And... Um, and so it needs to be sung that way. Um, I, have, <clears throat> I have an English rendition there too that um, is brand new, but I, <clears throat> you know, Vicki, I thought as many as have been baptized, is that the old version or is that the new version? <laughs> because I got screwed up. I have it right here, I can check it. <laughs> okay, why don't you check that? Because I changed it. And it's the same, it's the same tune. As many as have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, hallelujah. Is yeah, that different than what we had? One word difference. As many of you as were baptized into Christ. As many of you. Of you. As many. Yeah, As we're baptized. That's good. I'll try to figure out how to sing that later. <laughs> uh, okay, but hey, we're, we're not going to do that. We'll we won't do the English tonight. We'll just do the uh, do the Greek. Um, and uh, you can see the piano. The piano is down underneath. 
uh, in this in the six uh, six uh, line staff that I've written there. Um, and why don't uh, Kidiakos? Why don't you why don't you play that just once? Now the recording is slightly different, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so uh, should... Just the well, the Osius Christon should be okay. Okay. Well, the, the English I'll... is not so. I'll play what I have, and you can stop me if it doesn't sound right. <laughs> All right. Um... Yeah. If you if you play it sort of from the be uh, sort of from the middle, then you'll pick up the uh, glory to the Father, the Doxa Pati. Also, it's okay. about forty five percent in. Give me one second. Let me find it. <clears throat> if you can do it. Sorry, folks. I had um, I had trouble cutting and splicing, which Kiriakos knows how to do it better than I do. I think it's ready, though. So. Okay. All right. Well, that sounded that sounded better than I thought it was going to sound. That's good. That was good. So um, there's a couple of things that that I can not very many that I can point out on uh, page forty. Um, the tenor line uh, and in the third measure of the uh, second staff, the tenor line. That's a. Uh, uh, it goes do 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 do. That uh, was written as a uh, a musical nod to uh, Mike Petrovich, uh, one of my uh, mentors in in music, and that was uh, taken. That little uh, musical phrase was taken directly from one of his pieces. Uh, I did that also in. Um, in another piece, not from Mike though, I took it from uh, Taiki Zess. Uh, it was the Defte uh, Lavate uh, Force from the very beginning of the Defte Lavate Force, and I took it. I took the same notes that he wrote for actually almost two measures uh, from his uh, same Newman and uh, and the harmony there. So little things that we do. But um, that's about it. Uh, I don't know if, do we need to go through anything else, Vicki or Barbara? I would actually say, could we listen to the English as well? I know the words are different, but at least let's listen to what the okay. recording is and then maybe look at the language a little bit. Okay. That's so I'll fine. rewind my, my recording here and then we'll look at that. All right, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, Father Father Dean mentioned about putting on Christ, and I always wondered what that meant. But if you do go back to the Bible verses, and you you also go back to what some of the fathers of the church have said, uh, you'll realize that when you put on Christ, when they ask us to put on Christ, and uh, through baptism, we're baptized into Christ's life and we're baptized into Christ's death, which also means we're baptized into his resurrection. So it's a complete baptism, if you will, into everything. Do you have that? Absolutely. I'm Good, ready. thanks.
Yeah, and you'll notice that uh, this time I went back and used the same notes as in the Greek for the Alleluia uh, part because it just sings better. And it means that you have to spend four notes on Christ. But if we can't spend four notes on Christ, who can we spend four notes on? <laughs> so um, it works. I think it works better um, the way it's uh, written right now. Um, so that's, that is about it. Uh, you're welcome to take the, take the music use it with your choirs or practice it with your choirs. If you like it, fine. If you don't, you can put it in the recycling bin, but um, uh, it's uh, so, stuff that we do, I think is, uh, it comes, it keeps on uh, changing, especially if we're not satisfied with how it sounds and things like that, but it's pretty good. It's not bad. And I have, um, I have other stuff that we've done too, but not for tonight. So I, I think that the message here is that, uh, well, the, the last message that I wanna get across is, is that this is, this is one of these hymns that, that we call the Oli Mazi group, if you will, where everybody knows the Greek uh, tune so well that it behooves us to try to keep it in that, in that, uh, not the tonality. It should be in the tonality, but it, it behooves us to keep it uh, as close to the to the Greek original as possible. And it can be done. It can be done. So I give my, I yield my time back to Barbara and Vicky and. And we have Nick. We we do and have. Father Dean. We do have some questions for you. Okay, sure. Um, one question was about the English. And would you um, talk yeah. a little bit about what went on between you and me, you know, and why, and, and tell people about the hymnal and the new standard translation and then how that affects what we were talking about, about the words being different. Oh, um, well, I, I'm not, you know, you could probably speak better to that, but I can tell you why I use these words uh, specifically and not the words that I, I didn't take the time to go back to not only doing it because I, it was done on the fly, but but I, I used the translations that are pretty literally directly from the Bible that more than one person is translated. And in fact, in all four of my Bibles, these are the words that, that were used, as many as have been baptized. So um, I know it's different now uh, with the words that we chose uh, in the group, but that's the reason that I use these words. And it just so happened that they fit pretty well with what, uh, with, well, they always fit with the meaning, of course, but but they fit with the, the music too. It's very difficult sometimes to get the English to go into the, the Greek melodies. Why is that? Well, because on an average, it's about 70% uh, English has about 70% the number of syllables as the Greek does uh, when you use uh, two parallel um, uh, word phrases together. So um, you, you end up with too many notes as uh, Salieri said to Mozart and Amadeus, too many notes uh, in, the, uh, in the Greek. And so sometimes you have to, you know, stretch what you're saying or drop some notes out. Try, we try not to drop too many notes out, but it's a work in progress because we're living in an age where people want both of the languages sung and some other ones too, but both of the languages that we have. You know, you know, Nick, this um, this English question happens to um, um, 
just be a, a reflection of the conversation that went on yesterday when Capella Romana and Fordham University um, had a panel discussion about the use of English in our archdiocese and what happens with our music. Um, and uh, um, the discussion in part centers around, do we continue you know, to encourage a variety of different translations and different melodies yeah. um, and just wait for the cream to fall at the top, come to the top? Um, or do we need some sort of um, uh, um, guideline? <laughs> I guess that's what we can do. And then, then the interesting subtext was in many of our hymns, there's these melodic memories that so many of our hymns, even if you did the right thing of fitting the text to the music and you changed the melody, you're bucking up against the me yeah. melodic memories we've gained for That's how true. these hymns, certain hymns yeah. are sung. Yeah. So the composers on Monday, yesterday, were talking from the different jurisdictions, were talking about how at least you try to have reminders in the hymn so that even if the hymn, you hear it in Swahili or somebody has taken a totally different new translation, that you memory is are. triggered and you go, oh, that's O.C. Yeah. Sweet Dawn. That's um, right. What Nick and I were going back and forth on earlier, the translation Nick used, um, his choice as a composer, was to, to use the Bible verses. Um, on the other hand, um, a, a really sort of momentous thing happened uh, five, six years ago um, that took about 10 years to be in the making is the Our Holy Synod and Father Tony Vrame from the Department of Religious Education and the Oli Mazi team from the National Forum of Church Musicians of which Nick was a part of, um, a, um, worked with a standard, a new standard translation of the liturgy that the synod um, developed and got approved by the patriarchate and their synod in Constantinople. And so what happened then is um, that booklet was distributed or the the service was distributed to all the priests. And then the National Forum was asked to develop this new green book um, that has, that is for congregational use. Um, and then Kevin Lawrence wrote a companion liturgy to this using the new translation. And you'll see how they dealt with this issue of, of here's a standard text that came to our group from the synod, we couldn't change it, but we had to remember the melodic memory of this hymn, Orsis Christon, and try to follow some of the standard protocols from Byzantine chant. So they had a, a big, big group and Monday's conversation reminded me how very much in the forefront of dealing with a huge discussion that's still going on to this day about what do we do about the English and then how does that affect how the music should change or should not change or somewhere in between. So that's what we were talking about. What I was quoting was the standard translation from the hymnal and what Nick was describing is his use of the Bible text to develop his music or for that hymn. So that's what that was all about. Okay, Nick, there are a couple more questions. Um, actually, uh -oh. you got a lot of questions. I think you win the uh, uh, you win the prize for the most questions. Three. <laughs> um, I've got a question right. about the translation. Okay. Um, you know, I, I I'm not sure if my understanding of the Greek is as nuanced as it could be, but it seems like your translation, Nick, is very true to the Greek in that the Greek is osis Christon and baptistata, which is as many of you have, who in Christ have been baptized. But the, but the Galatians text talks, you know, it's because Paul is preaching, it's a, it's a I don't know, a second person, I guess, so it's all of you who have been baptized into Christ. And, and I've seen that translation, for example, in Frank's um, 
English translation, he says, all ye who have been baptized into Christ using, I guess, the four more formal English usage. So, um, I mean, I don't know. It's, it seems it's hard to criticize the uh, Greek hymnographers for, for blowing the translation, but um, it seems like there are two different ways of looking at that, so. I, I think there are oh. even more, Nick. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's, there's more than two ways, yeah. No, yeah, no, a million and, ways. And I, I, I totally agree with you. And it's not that I, I go back to the, to, the, um, to the Bible translation all the time. Um, I, you know, if I, if I were to, to arrange maybe um, five hymns, there are probably five hymns on a, let's say, I, uh, for the sake of argument, I, uh, five hymns in a row. I probably wouldn't use the same source or sources to do all of those hymns, I, I, to, to use the words. I actually, I, I try, maybe this is too much off of the, off of the, um, uh, what we should be talking about today, but, but from, for my own taste, I, I try to go back and try to figure out what the, uh, what the Greek words 2000 years ago were trying to say, because if you look at New Testament Greek, uh, and where is Father? Did he did he uh, duck he, out? He didn't... He's still here. I just asked him to start his video. Actually. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but if you if you go back, hey Father, uh, you should be probably the one to answer this. But but I try to go back to to see what in fact they were trying to say when they said put on christ you know like you know and and you think about putting on clothes you say well okay wrap yourself around them uh wrap wrap yourself with them but but theologically uh through the years and even then it meant so much more the the words actually if you think about it English is one of those languages, actually none of the languages um, really hits the mark as to show you exactly what is going on because the Greeks were, the, the, the Greek language at that time, to me at least, seems more like it, it had a spirit behind the words. There, it wasn't just kind of out uh, in your face, you say clothing you know that's not it you're you're wrapping yourself with the whole spirit with the whole life of christ with the you know and that's and that's what it means behind there and those people would think about that because they were brought up that way but we don't because now we're you know we think uh pretty straight on the on, on the forefront without without too much delving into the back. But it's the delving into the back that I try to do. But uh, again, to, uh, an answer to what you said, uh, Nick, another, another uh, uh, point is that it's actually an opportunity for us to use more words in English to bring out that meaning. So we may not be, you know, it, it may be in essence, allowing us to, to get further into the depth of it uh, and keep all the notes that we want, if you will. So that that's, um, I don't know if I've explained that very well, but Father? Well, I, th I think clothe then, thank, thank you, Nick, for those comments. Um, I think clothe then is a good translation. It seems to be pretty common. Uh, in the prayers that the priest says when he vests himself before matins, um, he, the, uh, the word enevisas that comes up again, and it's, uh, it refers to God who has clothed me with a garment of righteousness. Um, and I think that setting aside nuances of biblical Greek, it can be very practical. Um, there's a there's a desire, so there's a, not a desire, sometimes there's a temptation to compartmentalize our Christianity at different points in our life. We can be very orthodox at home with our families, 
But when we go to the mall in the food cart, how orthodox can we be? But I clothed myself this morning in this clothing in the same way that we were clothed with Christ. I'm going to stay clothed at the food court with my clothing. If I took it all off, it would cause a very awkward situation. Mm -hmm. So if I'm that tightly clothed in black polyester, and I'm even more tightly clothed with the grace of the Holy Spirit, why would I try to take it off? Exactly. Uh, Father, you. just keep going with this. Um, during a baptism or a chrismation, does, does this phrase have put on Christ have anything to do when the baby is covered with oil during the baptism or in a chrismation where our so, fat and our hands and our so, oil? Sort of tangentially, uh, whenever we, when we cover the baby with oil, we talk about the oil of gladness. So that's separate. But if when we put on Christ, we're receiving the Holy Spirit, then it ties into the chrismation. During the chrismation, we say, receive the seal of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm which is what seals us with Christ. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay, we have another um, question. I think we've had several similar questions about the English. So um, I think we've covered the general intent of those questions. Although Nick, one person, this might be just giving some insight into a composer is why do you spend so much time on some syllables? So many notes on some syllables, I think. On some syllables of a particular word, uh, yes. you, usually because uh, that word is uh, not only important, but it's the it's the accented word in English. Is that what you mean? I didn't. Uh, ask, I didn't ask the question. Kitty, oh, I'm not sure, I think okay. the question. That might be the one I sent. So you had made the comment earlier about, well, Christ gets four syllables, and you know, if you can't spend four syllables on Christ, and I know it's that was, a, you know, yeah, in, in just in a way as well. But at the same time, when yeah. you're deciding how to arrange this, you know, right. do I keep the Greek melody? Right. Do I change it? And in what ways do I change it? Well, my first, my first arrangement. Uh, when something like, if you go down to the second uh, second page, um, have put on Christ, alleluia. And then today it would have been, have put on Christ, alleluia. And I'm not sure that that's where we're going to end up 10 or 20 or 50 or 100 years from now. But but um, and, and that's why we keep going back and forth on on a lot of these things. Um, actually, having a computer where you can change your music is not a real good thing to uh, some of us who really want to go back all the time and <laughs> and try to make it better. Um, when when I when I wrote my first four-part liturgy and uh, uh, Frank took it and published it in, in 1981, it was done. You know, I can't go back and change that at all. <laughs> but this stuff I can change. And that's, um, if you ask, if you ask Connie, my wife, she'll tell you the same thing. It's not such a good thing. And there's one last um, composer's question. Um, um, maybe not for you, it could be from others, from Bill Cronus. In, in some versions after Christos Anadisaste. Anadisaste, yeah. Yeah, there is a mark for a pause. Is there a reason for this, or is it just added so that the choir can take a breath just before Alleluia? Yeah, I think that's probably. Oh, well, it could be for either reason, because there's actually a period after Anadisaste. Uh, Alleluia isn't in uh, Galatians uh, 3.27. Um, it's put in because we use it in the liturgy. So, um, and by the way, remember when, when Father John uh, told us that if it's not a psalm, then you don't have to sing Alleluia. But this, <laughs> this, uh, this is one of those things. Well, maybe that was just for the Kinonikon. Um, for this one, there is an Alleluia there. 
but it does it does operate like the verse refrain model right is that what it's doing like the what verse refrain the alleluia you mean there's the refrain. Well, there, yeah there i've i've written it wrong actually in the i can't see it is are are both the greek and the phonetics a, a comma yeah i think okay there should be a period it should be it's the it's the end of the of the phrase and the these and the these says the period <laughs> thank you very much those are huge we're just periods. saying about how um <laughs> you don't yeah, like how easily we can yeah, change things right yes, but could, wait could you <laughs> look at that in a moment like this we could just no, it's all great. better <laughs> yep that's good the beauty so of maybe technology. that's the reason that they did it that way now you'll notice the way I wrote it, I didn't want a, a pause there. And actually I didn't even want a breath there because I kept on going. There's a, you'll see the, in the alto, there's an eighth note there that, that if, you, if you leave the altos naked, they don't like it. So you have to keep breathing and you have to keep on the, on the first, on the, on the last uh, um, sound that you've been singing on the staff. And the vicious there. That yes, that makes it you don't get to breathe. It makes it impossible <laughs> that you have to, you have to keep going and ever and nobody breathes there. Yeah. And the bases are also still going as well, although you've got eighth note, oh, you got quarter notes up here and you've got the half note. Yeah. Yeah. If it weren't for the altos, uh, you'd be able to take a, a breath there. And maybe that would be more proper. We just do it right kind of through there. Yep. Through, through that note, essentially. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> Nick, we have a new question that you know yes. you have to switch and think of you you, you and the Oli Mazi committee. Uh -oh. um, I, I, I think you were, no, maybe you weren't with us when we did Christos Anesti. The question no, is talking not. about notes. This person has a hard time with the new way that now we've gotten used to singing Christos Anesti without going up to that note that finalizes the chord. Oh, at the end? Yeah. Um, Were you part of that Oli Mazi decision on that? Well, it's proper the way it, it's written right now. Yeah, why? It should, it, should, it should end on the G. That's the way it ends uh, in all of the transcriptions, except maybe no, I think it, uh, un unless it was uh, just, uh, no, I think it's that way. If you go back far enough, you'll you'll find it on ending on a G. Uh, that wasn't, that's not my, you know, I don't want to get into, um, to why, yeah, you, can, you, you didn't want me around when, when you did that one, but. Well, well, I can tell you, I, uh, Father, I remember now, Nick, Father Seraphim Deeds was um, on the committee. Well, yeah, Father Seraphim was there. Yeah. And I asked him that very same question, Argy. And you know what his answer was? He said, can you name any other hymn in the plagal of the first that ends going up? And there is none, which supports, you know, what you were starting to say, Nick, that the rules of the plagal yeah. of the first mode means that you should end the way this has ended. Now to us with Western ears, we want to resolve the accord, but in Byzantine chant, you don't. Father Dean, you may have an answer to that too. But that was the thinking of, of um, uh, where the standard translation and the music. Yeah, I just think we, we have to get away from the idea of what our Western ears want to hear. I mean, Father uh, Romanos at the seminary always stressed that a proper cadence in plague of the first from pa from d would end on a g on v and that's just the way it is and you kind of have to compartmentalize your musical ears a little bit and i know we all want to resolve that last chord but you don't get to yeah you don't get to <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's coming along each year when we hear it fewer and fewer people are going up at the end like we used to do oh yeah yeah it just takes yeah. a little time and really really loud singing Five 
<laughs> the problem is you've got a whole generation of uh, older generation oh, who yeah. still do that in the congregation, which throws the choir sometimes off because they want to go up and we're trying to do this one, but it doesn't work. Just sing loud at the end. So we have uh, to sing loud. Oh, well, we don't even have, you gotta do. we don't even have a really choir loud. right now. <laughs> You'll get it. I was asked where you could get a copy of that new translation I just put on the screen. Um, and when I say new, I mean 2013 is when the revision came out. I just posted the link in the chat. It's the churchmusic.goarch.org page under resources. There's a Christ is risen link. And I, I need to pull it up that fast. Um, it, it's in it's in the hymnal too. Correct. Yeah. yeah. It's been distributed pretty well. Um, but for those who are curious, there's a lot of resources on that page. It's and, worth and exploring. also on the national forum. Is that where you said the link? You got the link, Nick. That was not national forum. Oh, if you go to the national forum page, look under resources and you'll see Christ is risen. And on that page, it will also give you four part arrangements that were given to us that use the new translation and do it properly. End it like this. So there's some four part arrangements too. I just have it up conveniently. Um, so if you go under resources here, this is what the page looks like. See where is Christ, Christ is risen. risen is, yeah. So when you right click there. on that. Go all the way down to the bottom. This is, oh, there we go. This is the churchmusic.go arch. It, that's the same page I was ref referring to, sorry. Um, it's under go arch, but it's the forum. And then there's here, Kevin Lawrence, um, Dr. Techie Zess. There's a whole, there's a whole assortment here. Definitely worth exploring. Yeah. yeah. And just, you sorry, know, sorry. It's, it's interesting, um, uh, Angie, the, the, uh, when, when we had it going up to an A, when it went up from the G to an A, you could, you could end on the, on the major chord, but you had to, but when we changed back to the, when we changed to the G where it should end, you have uh, the, uh, whoever is, wrote the music has to prepare the singers to end on that G. You can't just kind of, take out the last note of what you've been singing for, for 50 years. You have to physically change the tonality before you get to the G so that it ends on the G. Um, and the way that you have to do that is by going back to the, to the plagal first or the minor key. And that's how you'll get there. And it'll sound right and the people will remember it right away. So it, it has to be a preparation to get back to that note. I, I think uh, it, I hadn't even thought about it because until now when you asked the question, but if you just try to, to lop off the last chord uh, for your choir, it's not gonna work. It's not we gonna work, that. It because, didn't work. Yeah. because that because that chord was meant to lead into the next, uh, chord, the last chord. So you you have to you have to go back a little bit and change the uh, change the arrangement a couple of notes before that, so that you can get to the G instead of wanting to all of a slip up to the <laughs> that thing. Yeah, and then it'll sound good and people will remember it, and it won't it won't be awkward. Okay, that's all the written questions that we had, a lot of them. Um, now, if there's anyone else here tonight who would like to ask a question of Nick or Father Dean, um, just, um, I think um, if we get rid of the spotlights, oh no, you don't have to, Never mind, um, Kiriakos don't. Um, but if you just um, uh, either raise your hand or you can um, find some reactions, and uh, put a put a raised hand sim symbol up on your reactions. There's a on that on that um, on the icons on the bottom. There's one called reactions, and uh, there's mm -hmm. either a something that looks like a clapping hand. This is all I have, so that's my raised hand. Um, or you might you might have the actual raised hand. So or Miriam just, raised her just hand. Just put your hand up like this. 
Yes. I don't, um, I don't see any, or you can yeah. just pop in. Right. Uh, so, um, you know, I had raised, I tried my little raised hand. I don't know if it showed up. I or see not. it. Yeah, okay. I see it. Okay, great. Well, I had a question. I think it's for Father Dean, but I also want to say hello to Dr. Nicholas because we met back down many years ago at a choir conference. Um, it was wonderful. I remember the, when we were singing Petrovich, which was very special. Um, but Father Dean, the question for you is this. It kind of came to me as we were, you were talking about um, you know, putting on Christ, that whole discussion that we were having. Um, and the image that kind of popped into my mind as you were speaking is when Adam and Eve were cast out of, well, first they recognized their nakedness, and then they were cast out, having been given some sort of makeshift way of uh, being semi-clothed, right? And that was clothed in the world, if you will. And now, in essence, the baptism, the image that came to me as you were speaking, is that this is a new kind of raiment. Um, so I just wondered whether people have talked about that or that was just sort of my fantasy going on. Well, oh, I think that's a, that's a beautiful image. You know, the... Um... When we give, when we baptize the baby and we give them a little onesie, we say, uh, the servant of God person is clothed with the garment of righteousness. And, and we say, grant me a bright new robe, O you who clothe yourself with right, uh, with light as with a garment. And it were kind, kind of reminds me of the idea that when, when the priests, put, when the presbyter puts on his vestments, the bottom vestment is, is the tunic or the stichadion. Um, which ideally, regardless of what color the other vestment pieces are, is always white. So we have this idea of a piece of clothing that constantly reminds us of the purity of our baptism. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? And while you think of those, I... I'm just gonna put the poll up. So you're welcome to answer it now, or you can wait and listen to a few more questions. Um, but before you leave, make sure you fill that out, please. I, I, can you it should can be launch available. it? Okay. I just did, yes. Um, and Barbara uh, Downey, I believe, did you have your hand up earlier? Or were you just trying the reaction out? If you have a question, feel free to unmute. Uh, I did not mean to raise my hand. I heard raise That's your okay. hand, and so I thought I was supposed to, but no, I didn't have a question. She's just following directions. Raise your hand <laughs> in the air, like you really don't care. <laughs> yeah. See if okay. Father Dean gets it. <laughs> um, Barbara, I, th I think we'll turn over the question and answer now to you to, to close out. We'll, we're willing to stay on if you just want to chat. Um, but Barbara has some closing remarks to make and we'll stop the recording and then you're free to talk and stay as long as you wish. Well, I just want to close with a, a big thank you to everyone who came um, and to especially to Father Dean and to uh, Nick for um, you know sharing their time and their, their knowledge with us and um, imparting such good information and wisdom with us. And, uh, and uh, to everyone, I, I hope you enjoyed it. And we have one more next week. Uh, next Tuesday will be our last session for uh, sharing in song two. So I'm not sure what our plans will be. Perhaps in the fall, we'll do a sharing in song three. <laughs> uh, we'll see things might be a little bit different then if we're all back singing um, at our parishes. But, um, but I, I think these kind of um, gatherings are, um, are beneficial to us. And as Vicki had said earlier, um, give it a few days. And if there are people from your choir, your friends who were not able to attend tonight, um, if they go to either the um, MEFGOX, the Mideastern website or the National Forum website, um, there will be a recording of this session. And there are recordings of all of the previous sessions from Sharing in Song 2 and also from Sharing in Song 1. Um, that was um, presented last fall. So thank you for coming. We hope to see you next week. Um, have a, a wonderful um, weekend. And um, if you want to stay and chat or share a little bit, you're welcome. We'll keep the room open for a little while.